God wants to heal you, your loved one, or your friend, or all of you. But we are the ones who now have to take responsibility for what comes next. Welcome to Man Alive. <laughs> All right, so uh, we uh, are in a series from Broken Boy to Mended Man, and uh, we uh, are back online, and so we want to give a, a shout out to the men who are joining us for the online Bible study. And so uh, would you, on the count of three, uh, join me in giving that very warm, rousing man in the mirror welcome. One, two, three. Hoorah! Uh, men, we're honored to have you uh, with us. Also honored to have Archbishop Emmanuel Kalini from Africa with us this morning, a friend of uh, one of my dear friends as well. We share a dear friend, Dr. Tim Smith, and so uh, welcome to you, sir. So um, the series from Broken Boy to Med to Man, this week we're going to look at chapter 6. I decided not to call these things by session six, because the, the sessions in the chapters don't match up. So anyway, uh, we're, we're going to talk about the seven stages of healing. The actual name of the uh, chapter is different than that, but I want to talk about the seven uh, stages of healing this morning. I'm going to begin with by telling you a story. Some of you have heard this story before. When I was in my uh, early 30s, I had been a believer since the age of 24, and I had been growing. God had been working in my life, and I had been estranged from my mom and dad. Christmas, Easter, maybe a Labor Day picnic here and there, if not for my wife, probably no contact at all. But as a, as a growing believer, I began to have a longing, a desire to to, for reconciliation with my, my mom and, and dad. So I, with some trepidation, asked my dad if I could take him to lunch on his birthday when I was, say, maybe 31, something like that. And he said yes. And I, I don't know why I was surprised, but I was pleasantly surprised. And so we, we went to lunch. We had a great time, wonderful time. And so we decided to do it again the next year and then made it an annual tradition. When I was 35 years of age, we finished lunch and we were walking to the parking lot. By coincidence, we had put our two vehicles next to each other in the parking spaces. Uh, I had a car, he had a truck, he was a working man. And uh, I still don't know why, but as we were saying goodbye, I said, Dad, could I give you a hug? And before the words were out of my mouth, my dad was charging me like a grizzly bear. And he threw his arms around me, and he squeezed me so tight that I was losing my breath. And he let out this deep, primordial groan. <clears throat> must have lasted 20 or 30 seconds. And uh, we drew back from each other with our hands on each other's shoulders. And then again, I still don't know what prompted me, but I said, I love you, Dad. And he said, I love you too, son. And that was the first time that I can ever remember hearing the words, I love you. It's the first time I can ever remember any physical affection with my mother or my father. And it was a transformational moment in, in our family. It, it actually changed the course of our family's history. Our family lineage was one way before, and it has been a different way ever since, and will be for generations to come. I don't know how to adequately describe what happened in that moment. But as I've thought about it over the years, it just seemed to me that uh, since my dad didn't have a father and he'd never felt the scratch of his father's whiskers and he'd never you know, had his hair tussled by a dad, didn't know anything about what it meant to be a, a dad himself. He was you know, ba basically left to guess at how to be a dad to me and my three younger brothers. And I, I just have this sense over the years that 
there was a century of sorrows that have that bubbled up to the surface that day and and the and the healing power of the holy spirit descended upon us and he sovereignly orchestrated that moment it was the it, i believe it was the holy spirit of god that prompted me to say dad could i give you a hug and uh, dad I, and to say dad i love you our family i never said anything about that to anyone and I don't think my dad ever mentioned it either. But from that day forward, I promise you, we became a family of verbal lovers and physical huggers. It, was, it, be, it actually became ridiculous early on. I said to my brother one day, uh, who I was estranged from also, but had very minimal amount of contact with, and uh, we were talking on the phone one day, and we went to hang up, and he said, I love you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, I never heard that one before. He said, I love you. I said, well, I love you too. And then he said, well, I love you more than you love me. <laughs> and I'm thinking, who are you and what did you do with my brother? <laughs> and then I said, well, actually, I've loved you for a much longer time than you love me. And he said, well, I said at first, I said, yeah, but I do love you more than you love me. And then I go, hung up the phone. I'm caricaturing this barely. Uh, very barely. And, and our whole family has been so different from that, that moment forward. I didn't understand the whole concept of uh, healing childhood wounds at that point. And I'm sharing some things with you that took me three decades to learn that I believe that you can learn for either you, a loved one, or a friend uh, in, in, in a matter of three months, you can do what I ended up learning in uh, 30 years. So uh, what's it going to take for you, your loved one, or a friend to start uh, mending? To start mending. I'm going to go ahead and give you the big idea. And um, the concepts involved here are pain, yeah, emotions, emotional pain, and uh, free will, you have free will, and personal responsibility, and the goodness <clears throat> of the grace and mercy of our sovereign God. The big idea today, a <clears throat> little long, what happened to you isn't your fault, but you're the only one that can do something about it now. So what happened to you is not your fault. You are not responsible for your childhood wounds. Uh, that's something that was done to you, not by you. It's not your fault. But you're the only one that can do anything about it now. So you are responsible uh, for what happens next. And we're going to talk a little bit about the things that happen next because we're going to talk about seven stages or phases of healing. And as we as I be, go through these, I want you to understand that these are not to be considered some sort of a rigid formula. And, and I'm going to be explaining how it's very possible that you will do these out of sequence. The only important thing in healing childhood wounds for you, your loved one, or a friend, is that at some point, all of these different stages do uh, are addressed. So the first one is overcoming denial and facing the truth. We have been talking about this in previous sessions. If you haven't been here, we uh, talked about the idea that uh, parenting is a privilege and a responsibility to give your children love, structure, roots, and wings. And if you receive the right cocktail of love, structure, roots, and wings, then you might say, my parents were affirming or my parents were encouraging, but what if you can't? Well, then you would say that my parents were one or more of seven things. My parents were passive. My parents were absent, permissive, enabling, demanding, angry, belittling. And then we talked about, uh, so this is, this is what would have happened as a child, but then as you became a man, uh, or your loved one or friend became a man, began to exhibit nine different characteristics of broken boys. You have a hard time 
believing that people really care about you. You're oversensitive and frequently misread what people intend. You're easily angered. You, you're not sure what healthy male behavior looks like. And then, um, so part of overcoming uh, denial and facing the truth is addressing what actually happened and how it's affecting you today. The second uh, stage of healing is grief. It's to allow the, the, the pain of the past to come to the forefront of your consciousness and then accept it, believe it, deal with it. And uh, as I say, these things can be taken out of sequence. So I was 53 years of age before I ever actually overcame denial and faced the truth. We're going to talk about these different phases or stages of healing one by one in the weeks ahead. I'm giving you the overview of it now, so we're not going to do deep dives on these. Next is forgiveness. Once we face the truth and overcome denial and then um, grieved, then the next phase of this is to begin moving forward and forgiveness. And it's to, for, to forgive uh, your parents as well as forgive yourself and, and to the extent that that's necessary. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about a, a fascinating concept that I've been developing over the last few years called it's, it's biblical, it's, so it's not a new thing, but it's a new way of talking about forgiveness, and I'm going to be talking with you in some depth about that. Making amends. Yes, what happened to you is not your fault, but it's also possible that you were a contributing factor. You may have been a difficult child because of temperament uh, or, or, or some different things. And then as a result of these childhood wounds, you may have done some things said some things that are there on you, and you need to be able to own those and to make amends for those, and we'll talk about that as well. And then we'll talk about renewal, and then this is the process of restoring a healthy relationship with your, your parents and perhaps your siblings, and we have, uh, you, you know that we're all here, we're here, we're all about giving you the practical help that you need to get you where you want to go. So We'll have very practical exercises for you to do in this area of uh, renewal and reconciliation. And then setting boundaries where renewal is not possible because in some cases, the relationship with the parents is, is very toxic. Now, in my case, every, every single time at the, age of, uh, at the age of 35 when I uh, asked my dad or told my dad I love you, and then uh, when I asked my dad if he was proud of me at the age of 40, every time I've taken a step toward uh, reconciliation and renewal with my parents, they were, they, it's almost like they were so relieved that I had taken the step. It's like they didn't know how to take the step. I was the parent in, the, in that, I mean, I don't want to overplay that, but I was the parent in that situation. I was doing what the parents should have been doing, you see. Uh, they were very receptive. So my guess is, is that in most of our cases, or the case of your loved one or your friend, as they go to do this uh, renewal, they're going to find very receptive parents. But some of you or your friends or loved ones are going to have toxic parents or uh, uh, angry or belittling or demanding, uh, still in a dysfunctional state, and so you're going to need to be able to know how to set boundaries. For example, and we won't get deep into this now, but we will later. But I mean, if you invite your parents over uh, for, for dinner and they come over to your house and they regularly belittle your wife and, and, and say things to your children that are uh, types of discipline, disciplinary speech that you wouldn't do, then you... You need to understand and have the freedom and know how to practically uh, say to your parents, we're, you know, we're going to put a pause on you coming over until you can treat my wife with respect and not try to discipline my children. Uh, and I'm going to show you how to do that. And then uh, transformation. And this, this is finally, this is the seventh stage. And this is, this is becoming, by the power of God, the man that he 
created you to be, exhibiting all the fruits of his spirit, the uh, love that you would be the transformed man, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, humility, integrity, wisdom, all of these characteristics. And uh, the assertion that I'm making to you now is that it's very difficult for us to become this man until we have resolved our childhood wounds. So now I want to talk to you uh, a little bit about God's perspective on all this because this is a Bible study. I thought about different ways of doing this, but I'm going to tell you a story and then I'm going to read, read some scriptures to you. <clears throat> I've spent basically a small fortune to uh, begin rebuilding a social presence uh, and then also to market this uh, book and get the word out and so forth. And I've had uh, a few men now I've had I've heard many men from many men who have you know written different kinds of wonderful comments, but I have three men in particular who are uh, I would just say they're badly broken men, and I've been in communication with them. Well, I didn't I didn't spend all of this time, effort, and money to surface people to then ignore them. <laughs> these, these men are the reason I'm doing this. And so one in New York, one in Michigan, and one in Minnesota. And I have exhausted the things that I can say to them. First of all, I've told them I'm, a, I'm a, a, an author, a counselor, and we live a long way from each other. So what I'm able to do for you is limited. I've been trying to connect them now, each of them with different people. One man doesn't want to connect. Uh, one man is uncertain if he wants to connect, and another man did want to connect. You know, when you're talking to somebody, and uh, you, can, you know they have a, a situation or a problem of any kind, uh, those, are the, those are the three responses. Some, sometimes a man just wants somebody to listen. He wants to be heard without somebody giving an overly quick reply. Sometimes a man wants to have you give him advice, that Solomonic wisdom. He wants that. Uh, sometimes he wants both. And sometimes he just wants to be left alone. And to know that and to respect that is what it means to not violate the process of relationships. With these three men, they engaged me, and so I engaged them back. And I came to a place this past week with, with all three of them uh, last Sunday, I spent about four hours uh, working on a letter to them. And I'm not going to read you the letter, but here's what I had decided. I've gone as far as I can go with these men. It has to now be between them and their God. And I had an epiphany. Okay, I have been speaking for God. Now it's time for God to speak for himself. And I, I realized that it's the word of God that's sharper than a two-edged sword that divides thoughts, joint and marrow, spirit. And so I, I did a collection of scriptures for them. And I'm not even going to go through all of them with you, but I'm going to go through uh, these scriptures so that you can understand God's perspective for you and for your loved ones and for your friends and what he wants for us, and what he has for us. The verse that we started with, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. For no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. 
For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and believe. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will, I will remove from their heart of, them a heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. A man with leprosy came to Jesus and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. A bruised reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out. Not one of the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to appear before King Nebuchadnezzar because they would not bow down and worship the idol that he had made, they said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace... The God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, O majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. This is God's perspective. God wants to heal you, your loved one, or your friend, or all of you. But we are the ones who now have to take responsibility for what comes next. The big idea from our last study was that it's impossible to have a wound so deep that God can't heal. It's impossible. You just heard it from the Scriptures. It's impossible to have a wound so deep that God can't heal. And But the big idea from this week is what happened isn't your fault, but you're the only one who can do something about it now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this biblical process of, of healing. Uh, pray that, uh, that as either men are thinking about themselves or they're thinking about somebody they really care about deeply, a loved one or a friend, a family member, that... Uh, that you would equip each of us to uh, be ambassadors for this gospel that we've just heard. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the questions for the week, uh, you have them on handouts for those who are online. I'm going to read them. Uh, first, number one, how would you describe the emotions you're feeling about authentically engaging with the stages of healing that we've just described? For example, you could be any or all of the following, excited, hopeful, encouraged, uh, positive, appreh apprehensive, unsure, uh, skeptical, fearful, or anxious. Uh, question number two, you're not responsible for what happened to you, but you're the only one who could do anything about it now. Uh, do you agree with this statement? Why or why not? And if yes, what are the implications for you personally? And then third, if applicable, which of the healing stages described 
in this lesson have you already processed and which stage uh, do you want to tackle next and why? So uh, go ahead and uh, do the questions at your tables and then we'll see you back here next week. God bless.